From the Oklahoma Newsroom, it's time for another Thunder Thursday. The offseason is upon us, but lots to talk about, including some breaking news. Let me introduce our Thunder coverage team. I'm joined by Barry Trammell, columnist, and Eric Horn, Thunder beat writer. I believe uh, Brett Dawson, our other Thunder beat writer, off on uh, some time away. But uh, guys, as I mentioned, breaking news, and Eric, you're all over this, uh, finding out that uh, uh, assistant Maurice Cheeks is in the hospital in Philadelphia. What do we know right now about his situation? Well, not a ton. Uh, that he's doing fine. He was basically on a flight to Philadelphia. It's not clear where he was coming from. He could have been coming from here. Could have been coming from anywhere. But basically, the Thunder is aware of his condition. He was in a Philadelphia area hospital getting tests for whatever happened on this flight, and that he is doing well at the time. Uh, you know, Cheeks had a hip. Uh, he had a hip surgery last year during the season that forced him to miss about a month of time. He had to step away from the, the team. Uh, he's 60 years old. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see what happens from here on out in terms of the Thunder assistant uh, position. Yeah. Uh, he's expected to come back to staff next season. He was on the entire staff this year. And, uh, you know, the Thunder already has to replace one res assistant right. after Anthony Grant left to go to Dayton. So it's going to be interesting to see. Uh, what Maurice Cheeks' role is going to be going forward. Yeah, and obviously, Barry, we know that Maurice Cheeks is a guy that has worked a ton with Russell Westbrook as sort of his his guy, if you will, on the coaching staff and Anthony Grant being a guy that I know worked with guards too. I mean, that, that position, which is obviously important to this franchise because Russell Westbrook's important, you got to have the right guys in those spots. Yeah, and, you know, Cheeks is obviously a guy that matters to the Thunder because – he left and they brought him back. A lot of times when a guy leaves, uh, doesn't really uh, necessarily come back. So uh, I think uh, Mo is very highly valued in the Thunder, uh, in the Thunder hierarchy, and uh, you know hopefully uh, everything's okay with him. Eric, any idea you mentioned Anthony Grant's departure? Have we heard anything on who might take that spot? Is that something we expect to hear about in coming weeks here? Nothing as of yet. Uh, it was something that went a little deeper into the summer uh, last time around. Uh, when we got news of Adrian Griffin coming on the Thunder staff. It could be a situation where they promote from within. You know, Mark Dagnall has been a guy that the Oklahoma City Blue coach is coming off a successful season with them, leading them to the D-League finals. Uh, he was a guy that was uh, in the, uh, he was in the running to, for, or, or not in the running rather, but he's been a guy that they promoted and, and had on the bench at times when there's been an assistant step away. Uh, he was on the bench last year when Cheeks uh, went uh, out with his uh, hip surgery. So that's a guy you could look at. And then, uh, you know, there were some guys who we expected to maybe uh, be on the market who weren't going to be on the market. And the Thunder could be looking at some people who uh, are coming out of this series with Golden State and in uh, Cleveland as maybe some potential candidates as well. Well, you mentioned that series. Now uh, all the talk in the NBA world, I mentioned being the offseason a little bit ago, but obviously we're not to that point for all the teams yet as we now have round three between the Warriors and the Cavs. Uh, we talked a little bit about this series last time we were here on Thunder Thursday. Thursday, but let's talk about uh, now that it's upon us. They play tonight, game one in Oakland. Barry, who wins game one? Well, I think uh, I'm bound to take uh, Golden State <laughs> since I think they're going to win all the games. I picked a sweep. So, um, you know, I just uh, I think these are two fantastically competitive, fantastically high achieving, high playing teams that are very even. And then the Golden State Warriors added Kevin Durant. Mm. So, I don't. I don't think they're quite as close as we think they are. LeBron James is fantastic. Uh, what he's done is, is historic. He's an epic player. But he's going up against an epic collection of talent. Yeah. Eric, a week ago when Barry picked the sweep for this series, you said you thought that the Cavs would win a, a, a lengthy series. I think you said seven games, although maybe six winning on uh, Ohio soil, if you will. Are you sticking with that? And, and who you got winning game one? I might be waffling a little, um, <laughs> but I'm not going as extreme as Barry is. I, I think Warriors and Six would be um, more appropriate in this instance. I, I really have thought about it in the past uh, week or so. It's going to be really difficult for the Cavaliers to go and win a Game 7 in Golden State like they did last year. And even that took some crazy circumstances. Draymond Green uh, getting suspended for that Game 5 in which the Cavaliers won on the road. So it's going to be really tough for the Cavaliers to win um, enough road games to win this series the way that Golden State's playing, not to mention they have Kevin Durant. But um, it, again, uh, I think the Cavs are going to make this a series. I don't think it's going to be a, a four-game series. Um, I, I think that they have a chance in game one. We saw Golden State 
come out rusty against the Spurs after having a long layoff in, in that first game one, and then Kawhi Leonard got hurt, and then the series was essentially over mm-hmm. from there. So the Cavs do have an opportunity. We saw um, the Thunder come go into Golden State last year and get an upset in a game one situation on the road. And then again, they had Kevin Durant back then. But uh, yeah. <laughs> different circumstances, I think the Cavs do have an opportunity in game one to make a statement, and it would be nice if they could because then it would be a really compelling series from there. Ten days of layoff for the Warriors, seven for the Cavs. This has been a long time since either of these teams have played basketball. But I'm wondering, Barry, we were talking about this actually before we came into the studio, is there too much value being placed on these last games we saw the Warriors play? As Eric mentioned, once the Spurs lost Kawhi Leonard and were already without Tony Parker, that's maybe a Spurs team that the Thunder could have beaten in the series if they really would have got going. I mean, they were no match for the Warriors. Are we putting too much stock in that when we're valuing how good the Warriors are right now? I don't know if other people are. I didn't put any stock in it because what you said is right. The Spurs were a shell of themselves. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the Warriors just systematically took out Utah, which is a yeah. very good team and a tough team to play against. Utah, uh, you know, plays defense, controls the ball, and yet Golden State was never pushed. And the truth is, the Warriors won 67 games. That's with Durant missing two months. That's with learning to play together for the first month. Uh, this is an historically great team, and uh, there's just not anybody in the league that can match them. The only people that can come close are the Cavaliers. So uh, it'll be interesting. It'll be competitive. I think uh, I think uh, Cleveland will, will put up a great fight. I don't think you'll see many, if any, blowouts. Mm. I just don't see how at the, by after 48 minutes where anybody's going to be able to guard the Warriors to any great extent. All right, so we've talked about Kevin Durant. We've talked about LeBron James and, and talking about this series. Those are obviously the two big stars. I mean, in a, a series with a ton of stars, in a, in a series with seven all-stars, I mean, almost unheard of, t- those two guys become the bright, shining lights. Who's got more on the line, Eric? I thought it was Kevin Durant at first, but uh, the way that everybody's been talking about this, you know, LeBron James, Michael Jordan comparison, I think from a historical standpoint, LeBron James actually may have more on the line Mm. in this series. Even if Kevin Durant loses this series and Golden State loses this series, you know, we're going to talk about how, oh, Kevin Durant was the reason that the that the Warriors lost this series, or we're going to try and heap blame on Kevin Durant because they got this far and happened to lose. But Kevin Durant's going to have another opportunity to come back and win three or four championships with the Warriors. I don't think there's as much on the line for him personally because I think he's going to have multiple opportunities to do this. Uh, you know, the way that the league is stacked and the way that this team is stacked, they're, they're going to be a dominant team for as long as they want it to be because, the, uh, I mean, apparently Kevin Durant's going to be taking less money, as we'll talk about. Uh, so they're going to be able <laughs> to Don't get ahead of yourself, sorry, Eric. Sorry. They're going to be able to fit um, some of these bit part players, like not bit part players, but guys that are uh, key contributors like Andre Iguodala and uh, Sean Livingston into the cap. It's going to make this team a dominant force for years to come. So I I don't know if as much pressure is on Kevin Durant necessarily as there was in the beginning or there is now. Mm -hmm. I I think from a historical standpoint, the LeBron, Michael, Jordan argument has become even more loud since the playoffs has gone on. And and LeBron's got a lot on stake here. You know, if if he wins this, there's going to be a strong argument that he's the best player in NBA history. Hmm. Barry, you buying that argument? Uh, Half. Probably not. (laughs) <laughs> Kevin Durant in this series Kevin Durant has the most to lose LeBron James has the most to gain okay. mm-hmm. if the if the Warriors win which they're going to win if but when Golden State <laughs> wins there's not going to be a lot of laurel wreaths for Kevin Durant there's going to be a lot of well he got one it's why he went there so he got one good for him uh, if he loses the whole basketball world will sort of shake their head and say this guy uh, is uh, is either cursed or foolish or whatever the moniker may be. If uh, if Cleveland loses, nobody's going to blame LeBron. Nobody's going to say the guy's a loser. We know completely different. If he wins, it's like Eric the Red said, all-time greatest, epic, Michael Jordan-esque. Hmm. So lots, lots for uh, on the line to gain for LeBron James, lots to lose for Kevin Durant. I go back to something I thought about yesterday as I was uh, – uh, sifting through the um, the uh, reaction to the the unfortunate racial racial slurs that were left on LeBron James' house in L.A. and it sort of struck me once again how roles have shifted. LeBron was always the bad guy in Miami, and now 
you know, not, not because of what happened to his home, but just all things I think have come around to pointing to him as, you know, a lot of people saying, gosh, I hope LeBron and the Cavs can beat Durant and the Warriors. And who would have ever thought we'd be to that point? But I think that is a lot of the narrative of this series, guys. A lot of people are going to be pulling for LeBron James, something that three years ago, five years ago, nobody was doing in the NBA world. It's, it's, it's crazy how that narrative has, has really changed. 2012 NBA Finals, LeBron versus Durant. Yep. Durant was the, uh, he was the good guy. He wore the white hat. LeBron wore the black hat. Uh, it's completely reversed now, and um, you know it, it, LeBron's career is interesting. He was the he was the hero and the you know the guy everybody cheered for when he was in Cleveland because you know didn't have a lot to go with yeah. him. He wheeled that team to the finals in 07 and kept challenging in, in the subsequent years. Then he became the villain in Miami. Now it's come back full circle. Yeah, it's crazy stuff. Well, does this add to that narrative, guys? What Eric mentioned earlier, the fact that now we're hearing reports from Kevin Durant that he's going to be willing to take less than the max when it comes to contract negotiations to help Golden State keep some of these other guys uh, on the roster to, uh, to have manageable uh, salaries. How does this alter Durant? How does this alter the Warriors, the league? Eric, what, what's the ramifications of all of this? Well, the, the, the idea of Kevin Durant taking less money is, is really a notion of him just remaining put. Uh, it's not necessarily him taking less money. Uh, from, from the way I understand it is he signed on for two years. The second year is a player option. If he simply just opts into this year instead of uh, opting out and renegotiating his contract and receiving a better, bigger piece of the pie, he's essentially putting money back on the table to re-sign guys like Andre Iguodala, uh, Sean Livingston, guys that have meant a lot to this Warriors team uh, as they've gone on to this this record, uh, the record season last year and the great season they've had this year. And then, you know, just taking the opt-in option that he has now to, to take the money that he was signed up for, it'll allow for the Warriors to go and re-sign Steph Curry to however much money they want to re-sign Steph Curry to because he's a homegrown guy. They can re-sign him, go over the cap with the bird rights. Uh, it really allows for more wiggle room. You know, th they might have had to give up Iguodala and Livingston, guys that are free agents that were going to be made, or they would have had to renounce Andre Iguodala because he was going to be making, you know, in upwards of 10 to $11 million this year. So it really just gives him an opportunity to, to bring those guys back and keep the band together. And it, it's got to be pretty demoralizing for the rest of the league to understand that they're going to be able to keep that core together where you thought, you know, maybe a Livingston would go somewhere else, maybe Iguodala would go elsewhere. And Iguodala is so key to their best lineups. Well, and Barry, I think that seems to really sort of hit at it. Is is this signaling to the rest of the league that this is a group that's going to be a force to be reckoned with, not just now, but for maybe a long time to come? Well, uh, yes. And, and no, frankly, there's never been a reason to this point to think they were going to break up. I mean, there was no reason to think – uh, Clay Thompson or Draymond Green or Curry or Durant, any of them was going to go anywhere else. Now, if Andre Iguodala leaves, that would hurt the Warriors. If Sean Livingston left, that would hurt the Warriors. In a really good NBA Finals against the Cavs, they'd probably only win in five games. So, uh, <laughs> let's not overstate, you know, the importance. As long as they've got those four guys together, that's the demoralizing part. So. Uh, I think it's just completely special that Kevin Durant's going to sacrifice some money to stay in uh, Oakland uh, after uh, through sort of uh, auxiliary channels criticizing Sam Presti's team building over the last few years. So uh, I think that's really uh, I think that's really uh, cool of Kevin. So uh, happy happy 2019 NBA title, Golden State. Everybody's fired up. What was what was it that Russell Westbrook said? That's cute. Is that, is that the line? That's, 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 That's cute, Kevin. That's cute. What it really comes down to is that the Warriors have had a, a really fortuitous set of circumstances that have allowed for this thing to happen. Uh, you know, being able to sign Clay and Draymond before the big cap spike happened, and going from $70 million to $94 million, uh, in one off season, that opened up the door to be able to fit Kevin Durant into the cap. But it doesn't happen unless you've got Draymond, and um, and Clay Thompson signing before the cap spike, and you've also got Steph Curry having those funky ankles to yeah. where he's got a below market deal now, where he's only making eleven or twelve million dollars, and he's already won two MVPs on it. Right, right. Lots of lots of uh, stuff working in the Warriors' favor. All right. Um, speaking of players and their contracts.
players are opting out. This has sort of become uh, a, a, a thing. I don't know if I want to call it a trend yet, but we're seeing some guys opt out. C.J. Miles, um, then uh, Gallinari, Rudy Gay. I mean, these are guys that the Thunder have been mentioned with as possible targets of bringing these guys in before. Eric, does this uh, alter anything in your mind for the Thunder as they look at uh, potential offseason moves? You know, I even thought that even a guy like Sean Livingston would be an option, but I mean, with the way that Golden State is, is or Kevin Durant's making these quote-unquote sacrifices, he'll be able to come back and, and just they can just redo their whole thing all over again. C.J. Miles is an intriguing guy. He made uh, probably less than $5 million last year. I mean, the, if the Thunder was able to use that that top tier mid level exception that would be around eight million. That would be an upgrade uh, for for CJ Miles's pocketbook, and it would be an upgrade for the Thunder's bench, frankly, because CJ Miles is a quality NBA player, and he has been for the past ten years. Uh, I think that Gallinari and Rudy Gay are going to be a little bit out of the Thunder's price range when it comes to free agency. That's the reason that Rudy Gay opted out of his deal. Uh, he's there's no way he's going to be making mid level exception money, especially because he opted out of making potentially 13 or 14 million dollars mm -hmm. this upcoming year. He could have came back to Sacramento and made that much money. Is he willing to take that much of a discount just to get to a winner? Probably not. <laughs> Are any of those guys interesting enough in your mind, Barry, that the Thunder might make a move even on a, at a higher price for some of those guys? Well, I don't know. The, the, the Thunder is so hamstrung on the cap that they really can't go after a, a free agent that's in the, you know, in the uh, above $10 million. Or, mm -hmm. The, uh, the mid-level exception, if it is at eight, which is what it will be if they're not over the, uh, over the cap, then you know, they, they would have a shot maybe at somebody like C.J. Miles. But the truth is, they're not going to get a difference maker. They're not going to get a, an elite free agent uh, this season. It's just not going to happen. So um, I think uh, we have to look towards uh, journeyman or we have to look towards trade in terms of new blood coming into the Thunder or, and, of course, the draft. So yeah. the free agents, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's difficult. Historically, it's been hard to get free agents to come to Oklahoma City and other places, Salt Lake, Orlando, places like that. Uh, so it's tough to get them here, and it's tough now to fit them in the cap. That window is very narrow this summer. Typically, the teams with the cap space are the ones that aren't very good. Mm -hmm. uh, you're spending money if you're, if you're going to be a contender most of the time. Even the teams that have cap space currently, they're going to have to re-sign guys that help them be successful in the playoffs. For instance, like a Washington with a guy like Otto Porter. He's a restricted free agent. They're going to throw all the money they can at him so that they don't have to match somebody in free agency. Uh, a team like Milwaukee that's going to have to bring back a Tony Snell who's a versatile defender and can hit threes. The teams that were in the playoffs that are under the cap, they're still going to be cap strung by the time free agency comes around because they're going to have to retain the guys that helped them get to where they were. All right, guys. June is just beginning. That means the draft will be here before we know it. We'll have lots more to talk about with the Thunder. We'll obviously continue to update the situation with assistant coach Maurice Cheeks, so you can check that out on NewsOK.com and in the Oklahoman. Be sure to stay with the best coverage team anywhere at NewsOK.com and every day in the Oklahoman.